French soldiers raped and sodomized starving and homeless young boys who they were supposed to be protecting. Documented cases of the rape and sodomy of children, of young boys in the Central African Republic had been known to the UN, had been documented by the UN, and had been completely ignored by them. France has suspended two soldiers accused of sexually abusing two children in Burkina Faso after the soldiers reportedly filmed themselves abusing one of the victims, a five-year-old girl. UN peacekeepers in Haiti sexually abused more than 225 Haitian women and girls. Peacekeeping missions have long been dogged by allegations of sexual abuse from the Democratic Republic of Congo to Kosovo to Bosnia, also Burundi, Haiti and Liberia. The uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and UNICEF were taking these horrible testimonies from children as the abuse was continuing, mainly by French soldiers, also by Equatorial Ghanaian and Chadian soldiers, and simply uh, sitting on the reports. When the United Nations learns of these abuses, it seems to be that the first, uh, the first response is to simply lie low and see whether or not they can get away with not reporting it to governments and not alerting the public about the danger, the imminent danger that they're in. This problem is pervasive. Wherever there are foreign troops that are ostensibly protecting the most vulnerable civilians on earth, uh, this problem of sexual abuse and sexual exploitation is simply rampant. The leaked document described a culture of impunity when dealing with sexual misconduct cases among UN peacekeepers, saying quote, UN personnel and all the missions we visited could point to numerous suspected or quite visible cases of sexual exploitation and abuse that are not being counted or investigated. The alleged victims were minors. How has this been allowed to continue for so long? Well, one of the big problems is that the world's perception, and this is aided and abetted very strongly by the United Nations right up to the Secretary General, is that this is purely a problem uh, created by member states and the soldiers that they send. In 2014, 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of all allegations of sexual exploitation and abuse that were reported to the United Nations Office of Internal Oversight Services were actually allegations against civilian staff, not against soldiers. Uh, so this is not a problem of uh, exclusively of the member states or even primarily of the member states. It is, it is predominantly the civilian staff, not the military, who, who are uh, responsible for the bulk of the allegations. International United Nations civilian staff who, uh, who work in peacekeeping operations and are sent from one peacekeeping operation to another to do jobs such as logistics and administration, politics, human rights. Under an ancient convention from 1946, uh, the UN staff are all pr protected from being involved in any sort of legal process. So whether they're witnesses, whether they have evidence, whether they're the perpetrators themselves, if, uh, if it has to do with sexual exploitation and abuse, then the Secretary General has to, on a case-by-case -case basis, decide to waive their immunity and allow them to be subject to what the rest of the world is subject to, called in to testify, cooperating with a criminal investigation, or actually arrested in the case of uh, perpetrators. And the United Nations intervenes and says, this person is covered by immunity under a 1946 convention. We will move in with our investigators and first decide whether we think there's a credible allegation, whether we think there's enough evidence, whether we think that a prosecution should proceed. And that doesn't exist for anyone else in the world except diplomats and, and uh, UN personnel. The problem is that the United Nations has no authority to, uh, to conduct a criminal investigation um, or to prosecute, and yet it intervenes between the time that it receives an allegation, uh, a report of, uh, of some sort of gross violation like this, and the time that it actually refers the case to the appropriate authorities. There's absolutely no uh, justification for the United Nations to become involved and determine for itself um, according to standards that are unclear to all of us, whether or not they have they believe that uh, that an offense was actually committed, and and the legal process should begin. Sort of an entitlement that the United Nations holds, but does not uh, does not have any justification for. It's not up to the United Nations to determine guilt or innocence before the people with the with the official authority to uh, conduct a, a criminal investigation and to hold people account 
can intervene at all. In terms of, of punishing the perpetrators, sometimes they're sent home. Uh, it's rare. We've seen over and over again the officers in the camps are, are covering up, the administration's covering up. Uh, in terms of mechanisms for the victims themselves, there really is nothing practical. There's the, 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 On paper, there's a system where people can file complaints, but it is really designed to keep people from effectively filing complaints. I don't know of a single case where a sexual abuse victim has been able to get any justice by following the UN's procedures. And this just infects the entire UN system and the way they deal with sexual exploitation and abuse is such a sham that we're essentially saying it, it needs an external independent investigation from top to bottom. French soldiers raped and sodomized starving and homeless young boys. A five-year-old girl. Nothing ever happens to the perpetrators and you would be known as someone who had reported so your life is in imminent danger. Secretary General will outline all that we need to do with their support. I will not uh, deflower the subject. It's a five-year-old girl. I will not uh, deflower the subject. Uh, pregnant, uh, then of course that is a drama. Uh, resulted in uh, the young girl uh, becoming uh, pregnant, uh, then of course that is a drama. So we are looking at uh, ways and means to provide them, you know, uh, for relatively cheap uh, r and French soldiers trips. raped and sodomized starving and homeless Thank young boys. Thank you very boys. much, Mr. Latsus. Uh, Edith Lederer from the Associated Press, and thank you on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for giving us this briefing. It's a five-year-old girl. When you were in the... Uh, in Central Africa, did you uh, meet with some of the victims or the victims' families? And, and if so, could you talk about that? No, because um, the victims are in somewhere in the province. You know, uh, there is a victim in Bombay, but there was a no, no opportunity to to meet her, actually, because uh, the the case occurred in Bombay, but uh, the man who is alleged to have impregnated her took her to another cantonment of our troops, that's in Bria, so. We are in harsh conditions, mm -hmm. and you said that uh, the welfare money you are sending to the country is not always in the bottom of the pocket. You are the fourth Frenchman in a row to hold this position. I wonder what is it about the French diplomats that gets them selected so often for this role? I don't think it is um, a problem. You, you worked for the French diplomatic service for uh, a number of years before joining the United Nations. And uh, forgive me for saying, but some people would find uh, the French engagement in the world affairs not always conducive to peace. And what I mean here is uh, in a French role in the Suez crisis, in the Rwandan genocide, more recent engagements in Iraq, uh, in Libya, in Mali. Now, you may dislike my next question, but I will risk asking it anyway. I spent quite some time in uh, Syria and often staying in the same hotel as the UN personnel, some of the previous missions. And what struck me really was how um, apprehensive they are about their own security. And what I mean by that is that sometimes they would spend days in the you know, luxurious hotel, in a gym, by the pool, without leaving the premises of that hotel. And when they did go out, they, their security would be indeed very tight. They, it would involve motorcades and uh, I think uh, in some way would significantly limit their exposure to both sides of the conflict. Not, uh, risk. But if they are Unless on the ground, uh, they are already there, and those missions, they don't come cheaply. <coughs> the they budget don't. for peacekeeping operations has increased this year again, Indeed. and it's around, Indeed. I think, $7.5 billion. And we are in, in a time of austerity, so I think it's a legitimate question to ask, what are we getting from those peacekeeping operations? Well, I think there comes a time when one has to call a thing what it is, you know. And let's face it, now the problem is how do we get over this huge drama? And you know, uh, to quote the American phrase, when it looks like a duck, when it walks like a duck, when it talks like a duck, well, what is it if not a duck? 
And I think nobody would disagree nowadays that it is that. And a huge drama at that. Look at the number of victims. What maybe you could have lived with or tolerated 20 or 25 years ago, nowadays you simply cannot. I will not uh, deflower the subject. Uh, pregnant, uh, then of course that is a drama. What maybe you could have lived with or tolerated 20 or 25 years ago, Nowadays, you simply cannot. The entire UN system and the way they deal with sexual exploitation and abuse is such a sham that we're essentially saying it, it needs an external, independent investigation from top to bottom.